So welcome to Ask Me Anything, a free form Q&A with smart people from Santa Barbara's arts and culture scene who've got stories to tell. I'm Casey Caldwell, the Managing Director of the Arts Collaborative and the Community Arts Workshop. Our guest today is Ethan Turpin. Hi. Thanks for joining us, Ethan. You bet. Uh, it's, yeah, it's fun talking to you, Casey, and uh, I look forward to the conversation. Uh, Ethan is the director and lead artist of the Burn Cycle Project, which provides immersive and interactive media installations on wildfire. Ethan was also the project producer, cinematographer, and editor for Entangled Waters, a video installation at the Santa Barbara Courthouse in 2018, and Video Feed Bacteria, an interactive video projection, self-generating behavior similar to that of single-celled organisms, among many other projects. This is the Burn Cycle Project. This is uh, as it was iterated at the Community Arts Workshop last year. Yeah. This is Entangled Waters at the Santa Barbara Courthouse. And this is Video Feed Bacteria. Ethan's work sits at the conjunctions of art and technology, emotion and intellect, contemplation and action, exploring human relationships with nature on individual and cultural scales. His work has appeared at museums and galleries around the country. I first got to know Ethan when he put up the Burn Cycle Project at the Community Arts Workshop, and uh, he made an immediate impression. Ethan is someone whose work continually arises to some of contemporary society's biggest dilemmas, uh, and we look forward to talking to him about the rewards and challenges of that work. Um, so I've got some questions for Ethan, and uh, I encourage everyone walking, watching along to post your questions in the Facebook comments whenever they occur to you, uh, and I look forward to passing them on to Ethan. So to kind of get things started, Ethan, what was your first experience of art as a kid? Or to, to kind of get to that in a, in a more fundamental way, I, I guess what was the first moment of, oh, look at that, what's that? Um, I guess what I'm most interested in with artists are the, the origins of their curiosity where those roots first started growing. Uh, so how do you respond to a question like that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think when we're talking about early influences, right? Uh, whether we're talking about as children or even as adults, um, these influences may not be in the context of what they later influence, right? So if we're talking about influences on art, it may not be art that is that influence to begin with, like a, a great work of art that then tells us, I wanna make things like that. That, that can happen, of course, it does happen. And that's happened to me, but when I think about like the most influential things on me from childhood, they are the things that are, were consistently there, right? Or recurrent um, that uh, weren't necessarily art, but prompted creativity. So I, what comes to mind is uh, I grew up in San Diego's Valley, actually not too far from here in a, out in the country, out in the hills. My parents um, literally, founded and built the school, the elementary school I went to, which is called family school. And now it's kind of a, kind of a, a pretty nice, like little private school. But back in those days, it was nice, but it was quite rustic. And, and literally we had a outhouse as a bathroom um, for the first few years, you know, uh, our parents were framing, they framed one cabin. That was the single school, you know, that was the schoolhouse at first. And they, framed another cabin and another cabin, you know, it was like that. And our play equipment was made of like big wooden cable spools and tires, tire swings, piles of sand, you know, things like that. So there was a very like a serious DIY quality to that and enthusiasm around making what we, what you wanted to have right for your life and, and an environment for yourself and, your friends and family and stuff like that. And it was out in nature, which was, you know, amazing kind of near Figueroa mountain. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. What kind of stuff would you guys get up to? Well, you know, we would just run off. So at recess, uh, we would literally just run off into the Creek bed and we wouldn't come back until we heard a bell ringing. So we were, you know, like the, the sense of boundaries to work to the environment that we were, we were allowed to experience was pretty open. It was in direct contract, contact with nature. 
Um, and, um, and then there was also all this building going on. Sometimes even while we were in school, it was a fire engine, so. No worries. Go by. Um, also at the same time, my dad was building our house uh, on his days off, you know, uh, pretty much by himself. So, and that was, you know, sort of an, an odd eclectic uh, house, you know, as a result of just sort of the, also the DIY quality of that. So that stuff was normal to me. Um, you know, these kinds of encounters you're describing where it's like an aha moment or a, like a weird, a big question, uh, questioning moment would be like encountering wildlife or, you know, things like that. Or, um, you know, is it safe to be around all these bees, you know, or, uh, you know, or, or how did you get that, that board way up in the air, you know, that, that kind of stuff, you know? Um, yeah, so experiences of problem solving, kind of, kind of dealing in the moment with the 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 situations nature presented to you. Yeah. So yeah, nature and also building. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that makes a lot of sense to your work right now, which in, involves a lot of you know. I, I remember seeing that the construction process was kind of elaborate for the burn cycle project. So there's a lot of kind of figuring out how things work and, and putting things together, and then of course there's a lot of engagement with nature. So that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't really, I don't consider myself a builder, but I think there's a, there's an awareness of um, that, you know, you can make things on a big scale when you're just around it, you know, so. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, by way of sort of a practical question and a practical examples for the artists, can you talk a little bit about how the Burn Cycle Project came about, the origins of the collaboration? process of getting funding, how the roles develop with the rest of your collaborators? Yeah, yeah. so the, the Burn Cycle Project is essentially an umbrella for collaborations. And I, I it, the, the namesake comes from the first exhibit that I had, um, which was at the UCSB library. Um, and it came about, it was one of these things where it's just good timing, you know, some luck was involved. Um, with the fact that I was starting to think about wanting to make uh, immersive video exhibits and other kinds of exhibits and, and work about wildfire. Uh, my dad was a firefighter. He, he retired as a division chief uh, in Santa Barbara County Fire. And he had died a few years prior to this. And I was, you know, I was thinking about my relationship to that content, wanting to engage it more. Um, and realizing that I had a lot of experience with fire ecology just from what I'd learned uh, kind of through osmosis and hiking around and stuff, hiking with him, things like that. So um, I knew I wanted to work with that. I wasn't sure what I would do quite yet. And I had this conversation with a scientist I knew named Naomi Tig, who is at the Bren School at UCSB. And she said, it's interesting you say that we just got some seed money to start a research initiative called Siri Fire, the st Strategic Environmental Research Initiative on Fire, mm. uh, to basically come. When up was with, this? How long ago was this? Oh yeah, this is 2013. Uh, so they were starting to come up with research questions and writing grants, and that included a big grant to the National Science Foundation. So uh, they said we have some. We have some you know modest funds to help support a show at the library and the library was also doing uh something called ucsb reads where everyone was they read the same book and that happens in the santa barbara as well through the library system and they were reading a book called the big burn uh which is about a giant fire in 1910 and really the origin story of the forest service and i recommend it um and uh so I did this show at the library, we kind of went all in, went way bigger than, than I needed to, of course. Um, Good for you. And, um, and you know, I really enjoyed figuring out how to approach a very public space with lots of traffic, lots of people, lots of students studying uh, a library with all this, you know, they have, I worked with their map librarian and, you know, archives that they had there, but also springing in things and installing them. Um, 
worked with my friend uh, David Gala, who had collected burnt and melted artifacts from the tea fire, which in which he lost his own home uh, on Mountain Drive. And he'd collected these objects up from his neighbors and from his own, the ruins of his home and labeled and cataloged them all and really was a custodian of this collection. And we displayed them in cases like artifacts. Um, and some of these things you could barely recognize what they had been, you know, um, but it really, kind of bringing this sense of a human dimension and a, and a sense of importance and history to events like this uh, with an intimacy to like, you know, this might be an object that no one else saw or care about before that, you know, but, yeah. uh, but that I felt like that helped broaden the sense of context. And it got me really interested in the, the, the many kind of spheres, scales, and ways of talking about wildfire and relationship to communities and human experience and and risk and you know comfort and the different emotional dimensions of of wildfire and um, so the project started at the library and, and evolved from there. Yeah. So right. So what? So then um, we got this grant and I. And I was written into it. It sounds like the it sounds like the getting of the grant is, is sort of how this thing so often works, which is the serendipity of making friends and and kind of just so happening to have that conversation of like, well, funny you mentioned that. I'm also also interested in this thing. Yeah, it was really a lucky crossroads. You know, I was, you know, I it where they say, you know, I was prepared anyway for this for this luck, but um, right, it was good timing that that they were working on this at the same time. And what was interesting is it was actually during a period when we were having very few fires, it was sort of odd how few fires we were having, but it was also just sort of the drought was ramping up. And I knew having just grown up here that we were gonna have fires again. I mean, uh, no one knew when that would really go down, but um, sure enough, a few years later, we California and the West started having historic mega fires, right? Um, like the T fire, I mean, sorry, like the Thomas fire. But before that, we had big fires like uh, the Ray fire up on Paradise Road and and stuff. So I was um, so I was helping with how to visualize the modeling they were doing around wildfire ecology, um, looking also at um, human management of fire, like what, where and when to do prescribed burns or mechanical thinning of undergrowth and how to, how to communicate that and how that, um, and how public response to that can affect policy in, in ways that are uh, efficient or inefficient or counterproductive or, or you know, helpful. Uh, yeah, you're bringing up a topic that I was curious in, which is is sort of the collaboration between the different partners on the project of, of you and and the the environmental scientists and the computer scientists. Can you sort of explain some of those roles and 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 how that worked for you? Yeah, so I, I you know I work most closely with with Naomi uh, Tag, um, who is a hydrologist and a modeler, and lots of people contribute to the model called the Rhesus model that she founded and. Um, but there are other players, other principal scientists in this team. Max Moritz, who's a fire ecologist, and he's really the only guy who's got a fire disciplinary background. Then there's also Sarah Anderson, who's a political scientist who studies social salience around fire and how that affects policy. So salience being like the how much of a ten, how much attention we have on anything at any given time often hmm. it's defined as disproportionate attention, sort of more attention than something really warrants. Um, hmm. And uh, and then uh, Andrew Plantinga is an economist and he works with Sarah um, a lot on the way these things um, get put into place as policy, the changing demographics and, and sort of um, effects of, of the human development and its relationship to wildfire. Uh, and that, all these things are nonlinear. And so that's what's really exciting to me is the, there are multiple scales of feedback loops occurring within um, the relationships between you know, human beings and our landscape and all these, all these natural forces, fire included, fire, soils, water, uh, vegetation growth, climate change, 
they're all going into this model to try to get at what's happening in the real world and understand, well, if you tweak this, if you increase warming, for instance, uh, say, you know, 10 years from now by two degrees Celsius, uh, and you've also done a prescribed burn on this south facing slope, does that increase water flow for you five years later, 10 years later? Does it, does it decrease fire risk later? All these complex relationships, right? And so, yeah, I mean, that, job... that's something I that's something I notice in your work is is just you, you is a relish of complexity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's it's a uh, it's an appreciation of complexity. I mean, I my worldview is kind of I, I see the universe as like sort of immaculately chaotic, um, and uh, you know. And that bring, you know, the sort of the stuff I do with video feedback, which looks totally different and is like very weird, complex pattern making that are self-generated patterns. Those are feedback loops also. You know, the, it's a way of doing a visualization of these complex relationships in this case, in that case between the pixel field of a camera and the pixel field of a projector that are continually chain reacting off of each other and aliasing and make, you know, uh, these sort of animated artifacts that continue and continue and to evolve. Well, that goes on in nature too. It's just not always easy to see or it looks quite different, you know, in every case. But like this conversation right now is a feedback loop. You know, I say something, hmm. you say something in response, I say something in response to that. There's a certain amount of order, but it also is always evolving and, and is co more complicated than we could probably easily track, right? Or plan, let's say. So, like uh, so, you know, the reason that we often feel like we're at the mercy of things going on in nature or society or universe is because they, there's just so many factors relating to each other. And it doesn't take that many actually to create a situation that is more complex than we can predict, you know, like the, the economy, for instance. So, um, so that really does have a lot of sources of inspiration for me and, and wonder. Um, and it's an interesting challenge, especially with something like climate change, which is so big and invisible and implicated by our like daily actions. Um, like how do you as an artist visualize these patterns in time and space? Um, yeah, you're, you're, bringing up a, you're bringing up a question that I had as I, as I was looking at your work and thinking about this interview, which is, you know, you seem to be someone who's, who's really trying to wrestle with, with really big concepts, with really big problems um, in a sustained and focused way. And uh, you somehow seem to be welcoming the complexities and difficulties of that. Um, and, you know, any time I try to do a project that, that deals with, with something that big and complicated, I often find myself getting overwhelmed by the scale of the problem, uh, despairing of making any kind of a dent. Uh, so how do you not do that? What sustains your interest? What, what keeps you going on projects like this? Well, I think there's a few dimensions to that. I mean, it's, um, like I, well, um, so there's an emotional component, right? If it's like, well, first of all, you just have to, you know, you've got to chunk things down. I mean, I, I think you start with, in, in disciplines like art, um, you know, it starts with a sketch or it starts with an outline. You know, it's like, you kind of fall back on how do you develop things no matter what the end result or content is? Um, and if it's overwhelming on an emotional level, helping it helps to realize to remember like, well, yeah, that's me and my reaction to the thing, but that's not inherently in the work necessarily, unless I unless I put it there or, you know, or is it there or not? You know, let's see. You know, I, um, so hmm. like with the. You know, with it. So when I'm talking, that sounds about, like a, sounds like an almost scientific detachment from the from the work itself. Well, right. I mean, I think compartmentalizing processes. Like, I think maybe I learned this a little bit from filmmaking, right? Making a video, even like one's own short video, where no one else is involved, is like a really complicated set of stages and processes. 
and especially if you're working on a scale of something where it requires more than one person, you know, you've got a director and you've got a, a set designer and an editor and you've got actors and all these people and they have to communicate. Well, there's a clear discipline in filmmaking or in theater uh, or even in how to hang a show of paintings, you know, uh, that is sort of well-established and you just like any job or industry, you try to learn what those steps are because it's overwhelming if you get too far ahead of yourself. And I do it all the time. You know, I bur bury myself in projects all the time, but like, um, but following, going back to like, well, what's the discipline that really helps, you know, um, and deadlines obviously really help too in relation to that. But let me, as an example, I want to talk about like Future Mountain, for instance, the piece that where we're visualizing actually, well, creating a simulation from this wildfire landscape modeling stuff I was des describing. Um, you know, basically what that is and what we showed at CAW is a video game, essentially, a, an, an interactive uh, self-guided experience of a simulated landscape with climate and fire and water and, and all these forces involved. And that started for me with conversations with Naomi, really messy notes and lists of things and arrows and trying to figure out like what went to what together to make sense, what distilled concepts, what was the most efficient way to represent several forces at the same time. Um, there was a, another set of drawings and watercolors that preceded that one, but, but ultimately I was making sketches, then color sketches, then watercolors, and eventually I was giving these watercolors to my friend, David Gordon, and saying, here, let's put this into the video game engine, or, or rather, let's design the video game experience based on the watercolor, right? So I needed to help from him, and that's a collaborative thing, um, and doing my best to understand both Naomi and understand David um, in order to do that. Um, and... It, that's very cool because it's like, it becomes more powerful than any one person with their limited set of skills can, can do, right? So, um, so that's how that evolved. And, you know, we, it's not a game yet, but it's a, it's a guided experience, but we're, we're uh, planning to add um, game incentives to learning about all the things that are in the model and that can happen with these different scenarios of the future on landscapes. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed playing around with that with that modeling when it was at the car. It, it seemed like a really uh, it was a really compelling system and and just like a, a really a really interesting way to learn about all of the complexities that you're talking about. Thank you. And that show was cool. I was I mean I like that you guys are there um, as a resource partly because it's like well I mean art shows are they're important for like saying like this is done and I want to present this to you, you, the audience, my work, the, the world, what have you, and let's have a conversation or this is an educational experience I'm providing and all that was going on, right? But, um, you know, in a collaborative way with lots of players. But it also was a way to prototype, you know, and get user feedback and, and see, you know, just how it went. Um, and I think artists often are doing that and, and should be keeping that in mind, right? Like, even if you're like, this is 12 paintings I've made and I'm, I am definitely done with these paintings. I'm sick of them. And here I am, put, I'm going to put them on the wall. Um, just from watching people, you know, body language or getting, having conversations later or whatever, like that's informing the next paintings, you know, or, or even if you're not making paintings again, whatever you're doing after that, you know, uh, so it is still, it's like prototyping, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the fundamental principles of the cause that it's is that it's a workshop. It's a space for experimentation, for prototyping, for trying things out. Um, so uh, it's it's fantastic to have projects like yours be able to take place there. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for bringing that up. Um, one of the things you wrote uh, that was really striking to me, you wrote the the Walk in the Wildfire series has a, a visual and auditory intensity that fills one's visceral experience and primes one's survival awareness. As the recorded flame front passes in the image, our mental space is itself cleared by elemental ferocity, 
much like the open smoky landscape before us. This physiological arc tends to imprint an individual connection in conversations. I produce experiences which I intend to be so sensory rich that thought may subside in a kind of media induced meditation. From there, we can introduce and explore vital narratives in a unique space. I thought that was such a compelling statement. I, I just kind of had to read the whole thing. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about some of the conversations you've had with people who've experienced if you're in, inside the unique space that you're talking about creating. Yeah, uh, you know, it is interesting to have conversations with people in that. And, and you're describing mostly uh, the walking to wildfire piece there, which is, uh, so for background, the, that's footage from fireproof camera boxes. Um, the one I showed at uh, Ka, um, with help installing it from Jonathan Smith, who I collaborate with a lot on installations. Um, you know, that footage is from the Forest Service, a friend of ours named Ian Grob, um, who's a filmmaker with the Forest Service. And they shoot this kind of stuff for a variety of reasons. It's research, it's product, uh, uh, materials testing for safety equipment, things like that. Um, and essentially these are cameras put in fireproof boxes, people set them up and then run away and a fire comes through. Uh, it's easiest if it's a prescribed burn, like a control burn. <laughs> Um, but I started shooting this stuff too on, um, on, on wildfires where they're doing backfiring operations. So when they fight fire with fire, it's a good time to set these up potentially and get that fire behavior um, uh, from within the vegetation. Um, but that's really scary, right? It's not, it's essentially, you know, it's like, it's deadly, right? You're, you're seeing from a point of view of the, whole consumption of the environment, transformation, incineration of the, of, of the immediate environment. And then it keeps rolling and you see the aftermath of that and this new kind of space, which has this odd in a way, often unexpected beauty to it too. And, um, and I think people, when they, they go through that, it's like a trial by fire type of feeling of like, it, it's very visceral um it, it's almost like you can't really be too intellectual during it it's you really you're it's like reptilian brain kind of experience and it can be awe-inspiring or you might be grappling with the fact that you know you're safe but you don't feel safe and what is this like weird proxy experience of being burned alive you know kind of thing and yet, yeah, you, you mentioned in, in you, you wrote somewhere that you've seen firefighters in those uh, in those installations actually get into their fire stance because the experience is so yeah. visceral. Yeah, they were telling me they would automatically start to turn their shoulder to it, which is their, their train <laughs> automatically kicked in. There's, there was a way that they would respond if they were ever that close to a fire that was coming near them. And they would also be looking for the burned air, the areas called the black, which have already burned. Um, to jump into hmm. uh, safety zones. And um, so the converse, so what happens is that conversation is usually at this point when, when it's like, okay, you watch the part of the video where the fire, the flame front has come over everything and now it's calmed down or maybe a new one is starting and it's green and the fire hasn't arrived yet. Um, and that's, it's calmer and maybe that's when people start to talk again or outside of the piece or whatever. And people tend to be kind of charged up and not, not, not necessarily like upset charged up, but like stimulated. It's like our minds then are now ready to engage with the experience we just had and the, the stimulus that we've just um, absorbed. And um, yeah, we have cool conversations and um, it's a good time to talk about what's, what did we just see? What's the behavior we just saw? What are the implications around community safety and personal responsibility about fire preparedness you know that's kind of why we do this and the partnerships that I create with fire agencies or you know other educational agencies that you know and that's my goal is to get this out there to support the curriculum of public safety and preparedness right but it it it's also such an aesthetic experience I mean I really do I mean it's art um, and it's weird because it's the only time 
until now that I have had this experience of like, uh, you know, this sort of direct utility around like public safety, almost like, yeah, you would make a PSA about the same thing, you know, a public service announcement about, you know, preparing for fire season. At the same time, it's like, it feels like a transcendent, you know, mythical kind of uh, immersive experience and they support each other. And, and like, I don't normally encounter that kind of thing. So, um, so that's exciting to me. And I, I, I don't know, specifically the kinds of conversations we have, it's like often people will start telling me personal experiences with fire. And I, and I really, those are things I wanna hear because people have all kinds of amazing stories and experiences. Uh, there's also just questions come up. It's a great time to ask people questions. Um, you know, ask a firefighter or something about that, that you've just, uh, it's been, you know, sparked, sorry, pardon the pun, uh, <laughs> in your mind. You know, it's just like, um, and, but I think that part of what's going on is that the dual, the duality that we're used to sort of framing the world in around having to do with risk is in question because there's, it's okay to say that fire is beautiful, right? But it doesn't always feel that way. You know, it doesn't, it, how can something so deadly but also be beautiful, even beneficial for the broader, uh, you know, interactions and changes in the landscape? You know, there's this whole yeah. Paradox. Do you do you see a do you see a conflict there between the the beauty of the subject that you're talking to and and the and and the dilemma of the problems that wildfire causes and and, and more broadly global warming? Well, you want to be sensitive, you know, and there's a, and there's care in how you present things and contextualize them. Um, and I, you know, I'm sensitive. To, I don't want to traumatize anybody. And I've had friends in there who've lost their homes in wildfires come into the piece and you know we've talked about it and they you know by and large they appreciate the piece you know i also had someone come in once and say turn down the volume of the, the roaring fire sounds because she knew someone who had died not long before that in during the santa rosa fires um and it was just too much for it was triggering her and it made perfect sense to me you know and she, you know she lived above the gallery you know so it's like yeah it's it's not necessarily like this is all um worked out all the time you know these are what makes this stuff vital and interesting makes it complex complicated you know uh and um but i think they're really important conversations and important things to try to confront and figure out if this is going to serve in some way. And, um, and by uh, certainly these are positive interactions and conversations most of the time, for sure, you know. Uh, but I think to get at the, the emotional component of this, it's like, we're talking about systems, you know, if we're talking about a landscape level and climate level dynamics that we would be in. And I think we're really used to a human centric uh, way of working our way through our day and the world, et cetera, right? Um, and that's fine, but it's really a particular scale that we're thinking on most of the time, that's human scale. Um, but the world doesn't always operate on human scale. And, um, and so our emotional responses to this stuff is, uh, I'm not going to say it's arbitrary, but it's like they are conditional on scale as well. And it's, it's not black and white. Uh, it's non-dualistic. You know, it's like something that can be terrible one day is the source of something better later. Uh, and that happens in nature, right? It happens with fire when um, under, undergrowth is burned out. And that reduces the risk of a, the whole forest burning down uh, if it had not burned, you know, in a, in a smaller fire before that. Uh, and that has implications for our lives if we live there, you know. So, so you're, you're, you're embracing the emotional responses 
uh, of these uh, with these topics because it's sort of yeah, necessary well, think... for, for us to engage but while still kind of holding the complexity and, and the fact that our, our feeling about it may be just one part of the story or may shift from from situation to situation depending on how that topic affects us depending on how we see that uh, subject evolve yeah it's that kind of framing and that changes and art is often doing this i mean i think great theater and you know storytelling and uh image making has always when it's when it starts to approach a certain scale or a certain intimacy it can be kind of very small and private too but like those emotional dimensions often are complicated and that's why it's interesting you know uh otherwise yeah, it makes a lot of sense very much time with it or anything or think about it very much you know uh, but it takes uh and a, a willingness to confront our own feelings and the feelings of people who will experience what you're making. Um, and I think that's healthy too. You know, so. But, uh, you know, yeah. actually, so I knew we were, I'm gonna, I wanna talk about this, in a sidebar for a second about like what I'm working on today, for instance, or just like this week. Or, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, maybe maybe as a way to set you up for that, um, you know, we're it, and and if this uh, hopefully this will segue segue yeah. neatly into that, and maybe maybe expand out from there, and, and feel free to kind of do whatever you want with the question. Um, but you know, we're we're living in an extraordinary time right now. It's a very very uh, strange and unusual. Um, so I'm curious in your work right now and, and in what you're trying to accomplish, what's your greatest frustration right now and, and what are you most excited about? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think often what is most frustrating to me is when I, and I think this is so common for anybody, I mean, it's almost the definition of frustration is that when you're aware of a potential that's not realized or it, that you can't quite reach or that we're that we don't live up to together collectively um you know you're like you know whatever i oh i was making this amazing lunch and then now it's all been interrupted and i'm frustrated you know whatever like the the the, the, the it has i don't know for me it has a lot of relationship to really though potential and um and um being able to envision something that could be cool and then it's hard to make that happen, right? So, uh, but that can be at all, any scale. That can be like the, our leadership, you know, it can be political, it can be, um, it can be in relationships, what have you. Often though, it's with myself and like trying to realize things that I can envision, but have a hard time making happen, you know, or manifesting. Uh, but, you know, with COVID-19, I think, um, well, part of it is like when we know it's like the basics of, you know, we just want to keep each other safe and stay healthy and be just and fair. And that was already hard to do in many, in, on a large context, like in this country, for instance, or in the world. And, and now this is making that even harder. And a lot of, you know, so for instance, I'm thinking a lot about people who are uh, locked up and maybe in many cases feel like they shouldn't have been locked up to begin with. And now they're locked up in a place that where they're more likely to be exposed to a deadly disease because they can't get healthy space. So I, and specifically like, um, um, you know, and this is sort of, I'm talking about this because this is part of what my creative energy is going into and what bothers me emotionally a lot during the you know, when I'm thinking about COVID-19, but um, how it relates to the most vulnerable uh, and sort of, I think, most persecuted people, which are like refugees who have come here because they know about the American dream, because they don't, didn't know where else to run, you know, that kind of thing. And whereas before we would try to figure out if we could find a place for them, if we felt like it was like not appropriate that they claim refugee status or asylum seeking status, then they would be denied. But now they pretty much mostly all get treated as criminals. Um, and so 
this group that I helped found called Pen Connection a few years ago, we write letters to uh, detainees, uh, mostly in the Ote Mesa uh, Detention Center, which is a private prison in San Diego. Um, and um, now that's like the largest outbreak in, a, in an ICE facility, in a, a detention center in the country. And, um, and we're getting mail back, you know, talking about what it's like there and how scary it is. Um, and it's just frustrating because, you know, you read these letters and they're, and they're good people and they're trying to get out of really terrible situations. And, um, and now they're in this one. So, uh, you want to show, I, I know you said you yeah, were, you were on your way to the yeah, mailbox. You want to show some of the examples of some of the work you guys have been putting? Yeah. Down? Yeah. So like my friend Pamela, um, did a bunch of these ones and I just love them because she's just decorating their names. I think it's powerful to see your name celebrated in the same way yeah. that if someone gave me a birthday card. They might do that. You know, it's, it's, it's cool. Um, and it shows that they're not forgotten that someone is aware of their circumstance, you know, uh, how long have you guys been working on this project? Um, with the detainees, we've been doing it for about a year. Uh, we work on a lot of different projects. We also write to voters in um, regional elections through a great organization called postcardstovoters.org. Um, I did some trees. Um, so those are great. Yeah. So, uh, so if me, someone, I, I mean, I, I think some, it's it's such a it's such a cool thing for people to be doing in a time like this because it's you know, when we have so few opportunities to connect. Um, and, and we can still send mail. If somebody wanted to participate in some way with, uh, with Pen Connection or, or inspired by the idea of, of these letters, is, is there a way that they could do that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so on, like on Facebook, they could um, at me or uh, and then in the comments and I can message them if they want information uh, or you can message me uh, through Facebook, yeah. Um, and you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where it's emotionally sensitive. I don't know what I'm going to read when mail comes occasionally. Um, but it's just like being willing to like, accept like there's hard stuff out there and, and we can handle it together and, and you don't have to have all the answers and, you know, that's, that's sort of another level of it, but, um, it's just starts. Yeah. With your, your capacity to engage with difficult topics like that is something that I really admire. Cause you, you know, you've, you've worked now on burn cycle projects about global warming and we're working on tangled waters with plastic and pollution and, and this project that we're talking about right now, which, which reaches into to so many areas of, of, uh, people being neglected or, or missed in some way. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that for me, I don't know, at some point there, I, I think about the continuum of like, doing the wrong thing which oh, nobody wants to do the wrong thing and like maybe i'm going to mess up and do the wrong thing and then there's like doing nothing you know while bad things are happening and most of the time that's where we are right and it i'm just trying to like get myself out away from that because what i realize is you know that's that's a whole nother set of th behaviors that that might lead me that way of, of, of doing nothing, you know, or thinking I'm about to do something or thinking I am doing something when I'm not actually doing it. Um, so you, you, you don't want to let the, uh, you don't want to let the momentum slow down. You just, just kind of keep engaging whatever way you can. Yeah. I mean, I think, well, right. And a lot of artists, they learn at some point, like from their friends, maybe they're, if you're out after you're saying like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I think this, I think, I think that, and I'm going to make this and I'm going to make that, but you're not like people will notice, like, are you making things? You don't have to make things, but if you're saying you're making things, are you making them? You know, that, that kind of discipline became important to me early on. And, and when I decided I'm going to really try to do this, like make art, you know, and this to me is this kind of a similar thing where it's like action. It's just about action, you know? So um, it's not easy, but it's like, it feels really rewarding, you know, when, when you're like on the other side of like that action that you just took. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that seems like uh, that seems like a, a, a pretty uh, inspiring conclusion, Ethan. So thanks for that. Um, really appreciate you making the time today. Uh,
I will post, uh, I, I posted a link already, but I'll, I'll make sure that it's active, a link to Ethan's website. Uh, and if you'd like to get in touch with him to talk about Pin Connection or any other projects, uh, there'll be a, a link there through his website or through Facebook. Ethan Turpin, thanks so much for making the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for everyone else hanging out and watching. Yeah. Take care. All right. Bye.